My name is Sanam Shanti. I'm part of the public information team at the CTBTO, and I have the pleasure of hosting this 45 minute session. Now, the aim of this event is to showcase the CTBTO's contributions to one of the most pressing issues of our time. That's the climate crisis, which has had and will continue to have a severe and lasting impact on our environment, as well as economic and social development. These impacts, however, are not felt equally by all members of society. Women in particular are disproportionately affected because women constitute the majority of the world's poor and are more dependent on the natural resources which the climate crisis threatens the most. They're increasingly being recognized as more vulnerable to the impacts of the climate crisis than men. At the same time, and we mustn't forget this, women and girls play a critical role in response to the climate crisis. They are powerful leaders and change makers for climate change mitigation and adaptation. Now, today's event is part of a joint initiative by Vienna-based UN organizations to examine the opportunities as well as the constraints to empower women and girls and to ensure their voices are heard. We recognize that their meaningful participation in these processes is essential for sustainable development and gender equality. We know that without gender equality today, a sustainable future and an equal future remains beyond our reach. Now, something very important to draw your attention to is that this event is particularly close to the heart of our executive secretary, Dr. Robert Floyd, who believes that developing actionable initiatives is imperative for breaking down barriers to gender equality. Now, as a further manifestation to his commitment to the goal of gender equality, Dr. Floyd became an international gender champion shortly after assuming office last year. Without further ado, please allow me to introduce today's speakers who will be delivering a combined presentation on the data that comes from our international monitoring system, that's the IMS. Although this was established to detect any nuclear test explosion, the data can also be used for disaster risk mitigation and for scientific studies, including in the area of climate change research. Now, this is an area that both our experts have been deeply involved in for many years. First, we will hear from Martin Kalinowski, the head of scientific methods at the CTBTO's International Data Center, the IDC. Martin is a nuclear physicist and he oversees tsunami warning agreements, as well as radiological and nuclear emergency response. After his presentation, we will hear from Yolanda kushmirchik Mikules. Uh, she's an atmospheric scientist officer and um, she's also at the International Data Center. Now, in her current position, uh, Yolanta applies her expertise to fusing radionuclide and seismoacoustic events that are detected by the CTBT verification system. This is using atmospheric transport modeling, that's ATM. After that, we will have 15 minutes to take questions from you. So please do take this opportunity to pose any questions that you may have in the chat segment to our speakers. For now, Martin, the floor is yours. So I, I share now the presentation and start it here. So this is about the role of the CTPTO in minimizing the disproportional impact of climate change, nuclear tests and natural hazards on women. We structure our presentation in this way. We will discuss three different areas of impact of gender specific uh, events. Uh, and then the benefits that IMS data offer to mitigate these. And the first is nuclear tests, then climate change, and then nuclear hazards. And at the end, we will tell you how scientists can get access to the data of the international monitoring system. This is the timeline of all historic nuclear tests, more than 200. And you see from left to right, the years progressing and the bars pointing upwards are the atmospheric tests. The bars pointing downwards give the number of underground nuclear tests. 
And unfortunately, women are biologically more vulnerable to harmful health effects of ionizing radiation than men. And this is described in a study that we quote here from UNIDIR, the United Nations Institute for Disarmament. It shows the lifetime attributable risk of solid cancer for men in the dark and women in the light, bright blue columns. On the left side, highlighted with the yellow square, you see the sum of all, and then you see individual types of cancer and the breakdown on, of the numbers. And these are numbers of cancer, uh, cancer risks solely caused by radiation. And here, the, the statistics is for 100,000 persons exposed to a certain dose of ionizing radiation. Obviously, gender-specific cancers, like female breast cancer, seem to be the main reason for the higher risk of solid cancer for women. Therefore, having an end of nuclear tests and the spread of radiation coming out of this is a way of mitigating these effects and uh, have a benefit, of course, more for women than for men. And uh, so on, on this International Women's Day, it should be acknowledged that women have disproportionately borne the consequences of the legacy of over 2,000 past nuclear tests. The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty bans nuclear explosions for everyone, everywhere on the Earth's surface, in the atmosphere, underwater, and underground. The treaty opened for signature on 24 September 1996. It has been signed almost globally by already 185 nations and ratified by 170 nations committed to international peace and security. Here you see a map. This map shows you the location of the monitoring stations, the sensors of the international monitoring system. And there are four technologies. There are seismic sensors, hydroacoustic sensors that measure the sound underwater, and infrasound sensors that measure the sound in the atmosphere, also radionuclide sensors. The core mission of the CTPT, unique Comprehensive verification regime is nuclear test monitoring. However, the international monitoring system provides a treasure trove of data that can be used for a variety of applications, such as climate change research, as well as disaster warning and mitigation. And that's how we get involved and support these activities with our data. And this will mitigate the gender-specific impacts, for example, of climate change. Because climate change can have an uneven impact on women. For example, poor women tend to rely more than men on natural resources. So when these are directly hit by climate change, women's livelihoods will also be affected. Collecting traditional fuels gets more demanding by climate change. In most developing countries, women and girls are responsible for this. Increased frequency in floods and droughts also had bad impact on those who are responsible for water management at the household level, and these are mostly women. Rural women tend to have less financial, physical, and human resources than men, so they will have fewer options for responding to these effects of climate change. So there is a huge side benefit of the CTPT. It's the use of IMS data for research on climate change. And you cannot imagine how wide the range of applications is. I give you just a few examples here with the hydroacoustic sensors that measure the, the underwater acoustics. Scientists can use these data for a deep ocean temperature profiling. And of course, ocean temperature can change as a result of climate change, so this can be monitored with IMS data. Also, the tropopause height can change. That's the, the little layer of the atmosphere between the tropopause, where we have our weather, where we experience our weather, our weather and above that is the stratosphere. 
the tropopause height can change and its change can indicate a, re a result of climate change. And it's quite curious how IMS data can be used to sense this because we only have stations on ground, not in the atmosphere high up. But some of the radioactivity comes down from the stratosphere. I could, I could talk about this more if you like, if you have a question. Also, while migration does change the patterns, the distance they, they travel year by year because they have annual cycles where they go. And this depends on the ocean temperature. So their migration patterns can not only be observed with hydroacoustic data of the IMS, but also how they change with time can be observed. Or the ice shelf is melting, and this has a lot of effects, including the so-called carving of icebergs. This is how icebergs are start to exist, break, broken up from the ice shelf and then uh, moving across the oceans. So all these kinds of effects can be measured with IMS data and scientists are doing this and that they're using our data for this purpose. Now we can turn to the third area of impact that is gender specific. These are natural hazards. There's a gender bias of negative impact from evacuation, displacement, and emergency measures during natural disasters like hurricanes, flooding, tsunami-related events, earthquakes, and so on. And just as a side note, climate change leads to an increased number of these severe weather events. And why does, why does this gender impact, specific impact exist? It's because, again, uh, the, the different distribution of ecos, economic and social rights between women and men. So a study of 2006 of the London School of Economics has found that with equal economic and social rights, there is no difference in the effect of disasters in women and men. But when women do not enjoy economic and social rights equal to men, more women than men die in disasters. This is because they are more vulnerable, but also because they are more in, in those who help their families in the times of risk. At this point, I finish my part of the, uh, uh, this uh, uh, presentation and I hand over to my colleague, Yolanda. Thank you very much for your attention. Martin, thank you so much for that insightful presentation. We certainly learned a great deal from your review of the CTBTO's um, IMS data, but also thank you for helping us understand just how women, especially because this event is to mark International Women's Day, have disproportionately borne the health consequences of nuclear weapons testing. Now, before we move on to the next speaker, a reminder that you are those of us joining you can certainly post any questions that you have to our experts in the chat segment for now Yolanta you have the floor for your presentation uh, thank you all for having me today as a speaker uh, let me start my part IMS data may help to minimize the disproportional impact of climate change nuclear tests and natural hazards on women uh, there are different ways how IMS uh, data could be utilized for this disaster risk mitigation. Uh, this slide gives an overview of the possible applications of IMS data. Data from all IMS stations are collected and transmitted to the IDC in Vienna. The CTBTO Preparatory Commission has defined the rules and procedures for data sharing. The main category are the authorized users who are designated by the state signatories to use the IMS data and IDC products for nuclear explosion monitoring. The CTBTO Preparatory Commission has decided to provide data for two specific civil applications, tsunami warning as well as radiological and nuclear emergencies. With civil application, we refer to natural and man-made disasters which require data to be available in near real time. Further, the CTBTO Preparatory Commission has given permission to the PPS 
to share IMS data for scientific applications, which I will address later during my presentation. IMS data can be used for disaster risk mitigation. For example, seismic data play a crucial role in the case of earthquake monitoring. At this point, I want to add that 50% of all national data centers are hosted by national seismological centers and their primary purpose is earthquake monitoring for evaluation of seismic hazard. Hydroacoustic data together with seismic data form the basis for providing tsunami early warning announcements. There are frequent underwater earthquakes and many of them have a tsunami, a tsunami genic uh, potential. The CTBTO provides data for tsunami warning to national and regional tsunami warning centers, which are recognized by the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. So far, 18 tsunami warning centers in 70 states have signed a tsunami warning agreement with the CTBTO. Currently, 98 stations are actively transmitting data to the various warning centers. The red dots on this map indicate the location of those IMS stations. Not only seismic and hydroacoustic data can be used for disaster risk mitigation. Infrasound data can be useful as well. Infrasound observations offer a range of possible civil applications, one of them being the capability of identifying explosive volcanic eruptions that promptly release large amounts of ash into the atmosphere and pose a severe threat to airplanes. The International Civil Aviation Organization has requested the CTBTO to look into the assessing the usefulness of infrasound data for monitoring volcanic activity. The Volcano Ash Advisory Center in Toulouse explored the technical procedures with access to IMS data as a scientific application. This led to the development of the volcanic information system that demonstrate the maturity and technical potential of the application. Another example of using IMS data for disaster risk mitigation are radionuclide data supported by atmospheric transport modeling. In the aftermath of the Fukushima event, uh, atmospheric transport forward modeling has been used to predict which of the IMS radionuclide stations are likely to be affected by a radioactive release and to estimate the time of a first detected detection for each of those. The animation in the right is an example of such a simulation. They were produced until the end of the event. The animation on the left shows IMS sample categories in the time between 12 March and 30 May 2011. It should be noted that the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant accident released radioactivity that the IMS system observed on the northern hemisphere for about three months since 14 March 2011. Those observations were soon shared with the IEAA and the WMO and one year later the CTBTO joined the Interagency Committee on the Radiological and Nuclear Emergencies. As I already mentioned, the uh, IMS data are also available for scientific purposes. So how to get data uh, for that purpose? The Virtual Data Exploitation Center provides scientists and researchers from many different disciplines and from around the globe with access to our data to conduct research and to publish new findings. 
VDAC is a zero cost contract and the only requirement is to, uh, is to sign by both parties uh, the confidential agreement. Strong relationship between the scientific and technological community and the CTBTO helps to ensure that the IMS remains at the forefront of technological innovation and that no nuclear explosion goes undetected. VDEC agreements are becoming more and more known among scientists. Since 2011, VDEC contracts have been signed by scientists from uh, entities representing 29 countries. This slide shows distribution of VDEC contracts per country. As of today, the total number of VDEC contracts is 172. The core mission of the CTBT's unique and comprehensive verification regime is a nuclear test monitoring. However, the IMS provides a treasure trove of data that can be used for a variety of applications, such as climate change research, as well as disaster warning and mitigation. On International Women's Day, it should be acknowledged that women have disproportionately borne the consequences of the legacy of over 2,000 past nuclear tests. Similarly, climate change can also have an uneven impact on women. Hopefully, the scientist, uh, scientific research and potential applications based on IMS data may offer benefits for women, humanity overall, and the planet. Thank you. Elanta, thank you so much for that inspirational presentation and the purpose of the CTPT verification regime and, of course, our multiple IMS technologies. I think it's a good time for us to take some questions that had previously been sent to us. So, Martin and Yolanta, I will pose them to you separately, depending on your area of speciality. So, perhaps I can start with Yolanta. Yolanta, we have someone who would like to learn more about the virtual data exploitation that you spoke about earlier. What would you say are the most sought-after disciplines that scientists and researchers tend to request data on? Uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, we have many VDEC proposals uh, to study volcanic uh, activity, including uh, submarine uh, volcanoes, uh, quite often with application of mixed uh, technologies. Uh, at this point, I want to mention that uh, more and more often data representing different technologies are combined to take an advantage from synergies. Uh, for example, hydroacoustic data are often combined with infrasound data to monitor, uh, identify, and characterize volcanic eruptions. Hydroacoustic data itself can be used in various scientific projects, uh, for example, to study whales. Uh, recently, a scientist has discovered in the uh, Indian Ocean a completely new colony of pygmy blue whales. Uh, this was made possible uh, by access to IMS hydroacoustic data uh, through a VDEC contract. Uh, the type of requested data uh, depends also on the current events. Uh, following the uh, nuclear test announced by the Democratic uh, People's Republic of Korea, DPRK, uh, scientists have requested IMS uh, seismometer data to study the characteristics of the depth of the source uh, in order to improve treaty monitoring methods. Uh, the CTBTO itself is involved in the multi-modal uh, atmospheric transport modeling ATM exercises entitled the ATM challenges, uh, which use IMS uh, radionuclide observations uh, to investigate enhancements uh, for uh, identifying uh, possible nuclear explosion signals against normal radioxinon background variations. Uh, those exercises allow to assess the performance of the ATM simulations uh, being performed by the IDC and other groups. I have to say that I also participated in this type of exercises. Uh, so the 
uh, those are only selected examples, uh, but the list is quite uh, long. Thank you, Yolanta. I'll now um, pose a couple of questions to Martin. Martin, uh, we have someone asking how, and you, you alluded to this very briefly, uh, how can the melting of the article ice shelf be observed with the international monetarism data that we have? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, when the ice shelf melts, uh, this is a process that involves cracks through the ice to propagate. And the, the cracking of the ice is causing noise. It's causing a sound that propagates through the ocean and can be measured and located with the hydroacoustic uh, stations of the International Monitoring System. Um, so the development of the melting of the ice shelf itself can be observed, but most spectacular is, of course, if an ice berg is created by uh, uh, separating from the ice shelf. And this is a, uh, a large event that, uh, where ice is falling into the ocean and it's uh, a huge movement and uh, this uh, creates a lots of, lot of sound. And interestingly also the movement of the iceberg along its path can be monitored because throughout the, the time the iceberg exists, it always develops new cracks and some of the iceberg is falling down into the ocean. And this all causes a sound that is very specific, very characteristic and can be located, not only recorded, but also uh, located. And this can be used even to track icebergs along their paths. And some ideas are caused by this to possibly use this also to uh, warn ship for not hitting the iceberg. Of course, normally uh, satellites are used for this purpose, but if there is uh, clouds over, if it's overcast, then the iceberg, uh, the, con the contact of the satellites is lost for a moment. So there are lots of things that um, IMS hydroacoustic data can be used for to monitor how the shelf is melting and what follows from there. Thank you, Martin. Many questions coming in for you. I've got another one to pose to you here. Uh, what is the correlation, and of course this is going to come up, uh, what is the correlation between whale migration and mm. climate change and how can our data, the IMS data, be used to observe this? Yeah, the first whales can be nicely observed because they, they have sound for their communication. And uh, as Yolanda already explained, uh, different breeds of whales can be distinguished by their specific sound pattern and they can be identified so that when they move from one location to another and then they make their noise somewhere else, they can be tracked because it's still the same kind of pattern of sound that they create. And this is used by scientists to monitor the migration patterns of whales because they are moving every year with the cycle of the seasons. They are moving huge distances and they follow the ocean currents and they like to be in locations that have a certain temperature of the ocean. So if the temperature changes and gets more, just a, a degree hotter, warmer, they don't want to go there any longer. And this can be observed that they don't go as far as they did in the past in the recent years. And does that mean that it'll continue to deteriorate in that direction? It's hard to make a prognosis what will what will what the consequences are. And there may be consequences for the whale populations themselves if they cannot feed themselves uh, properly or things like this, but I don't know about mo more about that. I mainly know about how whales can be followed and identified with our hydroacoustic sensors. Thank you so much, Martin. We have one more question for uh, Yolanta. Uh, Yolanta, among the um, researchers that request international monitoring uh, system data, 
Do you happen to know the percentage of women scientists? Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, yes, I happen to know this number. Uh, the percentage of women scientists requesting uh, access to IMS data uh, varies from uh, year to year, uh, but on average, uh, it's about 20%. Maybe it's interesting to add that uh, the first such a request uh, we received in 2012, and it was from uh, Australia. That's great. It looks like we still have time for one more question, if we can. Martin, I'll pose a last question to you, seeming as we have a little bit of time on our hands. Uh, can you tell us how um, IMS data uh, could be used to measure changes in the high atmosphere? Yes. Um, I, I mentioned already tropopause height change. And I need to explain a bit of the background. This is done, this is monitored, it can be monitored with the radionuclide data. So we are, of course, looking for traces of man-made radioactivity that could indicate a nuclear test. And we use ground-based stations that uh, collect air for 24 hours and then it's analyzed for the content of radioactivity. But of course, normally we measure the natural radioactivity. And one of the isotopes that we observe in every single daily spectrum at every station is beryllium-7. This is an isotope that is produced by cosmic rays in the stratosphere. And it can only be observed at the ground by be it being transported from the upper part of the atmosphere, of the troposphere, down to the ground level. And this is caused by vertical air masses, vertical air movement. And these vertical air movements form part of the, the global circulation of air. There are certain patterns how the air circulates typically, and this changes with the seasons. I don't want to go into more detail about that and tell you about Hadley cell and feral cell and all of these other things, but um, the, the height of the tropos, tropopause, and I need to explain also what tropopause is. So the higher you go up in the troposphere, the temperature declines. So at 10 kilometers height, where typically the aviation uh, airplanes go, it's very cold, it's freezing cold. Uh, but there is one height when you go higher, but the temperature is not falling further. And that is the, the area that is called tropos, tropopause. It's the interface between the troposphere and the stratosphere. So I said beryllium-7 is created mainly in the stratosphere. It, when it, it, for it to move down to the ground, it needs to transfer through the tropopause. If the tropopause is higher, it reaches the, the region where beryllium concentrations are higher, and therefore a higher tropopause can bring more beryllium-7 down to Earth. And we will notice this as an increase of the concentration of beryllium-7 at our ground-based stations. Thank you so much for that explanation. Uh, I, it looks like Martin, I don't know whether um, I, I, I'm not on par with you when it comes to the technical elements, so I don't know whether this was addressed earlier or not, but we have a question in the chat that's been posed to you saying, how can you measure the iceberg carving? Yeah, I, I, I'm afraid I can't say much more than what I said before. Um, it's the sound created by the iceberg ripping off from the shelf. It, this is, if you would stand close by, you will, would hear a large sound. It's not nothing that is silent, you know. Uh, it's, it's breaking off and, and it's uh, lots of ice, pieces of the ice shelf are at that time falling just into the water. It's not only one piece, one big piece of ice is separating from the shelf, lots of ice is at the same time falling into the water. So all these splashes, all these cracks propagating cause a sound. And this sound propagates through the water and reaches 
thousands of kilometers away our hydrophones and is recorded there. I, at this point, I just want to, to highlight that we are not doing this kind of research. We're making our data available for those scientists who want to do research on our data with, with these questions. Um, we, 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 we do understand what is the sound of an iceberg cracking because we need to make sure that whatever sound we record, we can distinguish from a nuclear explosion. And as Yolanta already pointed out, there's a lot of feedback that we get from all these good sciences done with our data. It helps us to better learn and understand, to interpret our data ourselves, to understand is this a nuclear test signal or not. Ajahn, thank you so much for that explanation. I think um, I'm afraid to say uh, the time has come to wrap up this really compelling spotlight session. And of course, before I do so, I'd like to thank both Yolanta Kushmirchik, Michules, and Martin Kalnowski for really uh, spending time with us and explaining the role of the CTBTO in uh, minimizing the disproportionate impact of climate change, nuclear tests, and natural hazards on women. Now, for those of you joining us and watching, if this discussion has indeed inspired you to think about how you could contribute to the CTBTO's mission, please do join us for a virtual career fair. It's happening on March 22nd for women in the fields of science, technology and engineering. That's STEM. Uh, this career fair, I think, is an excellent opportunity for women to learn about the CTBTO and how they can work with us and contribute to this very important mission. Uh, you can definitely find out more information if you wish to do so on this virtual fair on our social media platforms. Please follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook. And before we end, just a reminder to keep an eye uh, on the spotlight sessions that will be held by other Vienna-based organizations throughout the week and the lead up to International Women's Day you will actually see an announcement invitation with the schedule links and topics of the upcoming sessions in this chat. So thank you so much for tuning in, for being with us over the past 40 minutes, and that uh, we wish you an early happy International Women's Day. Thank you. <laughs>